Good evening and welcome to the City of Warrenville Community Development and Planning Committee of the Whole Regular Meeting on Monday, May 14th at 7 p.m. Clerk, may I have the roll please? Alderman Ashour? Here. Alderman Berry? Here. Alderman Bevere? Here. Alderman Davalos? Here. Alderman Goodman? Here. Alderman Hoffman? Here. Alderman Widener? Here. Alderman Wilson? Here. Thank you. Now, everyone, uh, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, now is the time we set aside for citizens' comments. If they choose, citizens can share their comments on agenda items while the item is being discussed by the committee. Uh, after your name is called, please come to the podium, adjust the microphone, state your name, address, and offer your comments. Uh, we have one person signed up this evening, Connie Schmidt. agenda so I'll be quick um, I'm really excited to be presenting this poster to the city of Warrenville uh, Warrenville decided uh, a while back to be a monarch friendly community and signed the resolution um, I want you to remi remind you this is a cooperative effort between the forest preserve the conservation foundation wild ones which is a seed collecting group and the CR club all four entities are working diligently to encourage monarch habitat. And the city of Warrenville and the Warrenville Park District, I think we're one of the only communities of the 33, 34 or so in uh, DuPage County that has both entities signed on. Um, those Only those who have signed on are receiving these special posters. And the way this poster came about is really cool. Um, there was a National Pollinator Week, and it is the day June 18th through June 24th. We didn't have a state pollinator week, and so our director, Lonnie Morris, gave a call to Rauner's office and said, how, how about if we match up and do the same week and we celebrate it here in, Warren, in, uh, in the state of Illinois? And his office said, good idea, and let it be done. So these are being distributed to all the libraries in DuPage County, uh, these posters, and the libraries are committing to do some kind of a monarch-friendly project. And then we are taking the time to hand deliver them to the cities like Warrenville, Downers Grove, West Chicago, who have signed on to the pledge. And thank you for signing on, asking you to display it prominently uh, in Tripoli and uh, share it with your community. Okay? Um, so if there's something I want to comment on that's on the agenda, I can do that later, right? Or should I do it now? Either way, whatever your preference is. All right. Uh, I'm so proud of Warrenville that they're even considering acknowledging solar as a, an important viable um, move in building practices. This is an economic decision that makes smart business sense, and I know you're considering prioritizing uh, businesses that are trying to make that commitment, and I, I can't tell you how proud I am of you. And I will tell you also, the county of DuPage is jumping on board. I was at a meeting today with Choose DuPage, the economic engine, and two members from du DuPage County that are working on uh, Soul Smart designation, and some members from the Sierra Club. And we are presenting, going to be presenting a program in September, again, like the one we did in January. And uh, the whole purpose is economic, the economics of solar solar putting solar on it makes economic sense so that's so exciting thanks for your positive comments and happy pollinator week yeah. early yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you okay seeing no other uh, citizens who wish to comment we'll move along to the officials and staff members comments mayor Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, noting several things coming up in the next few days in the city. We have a lot of um, good things happening. On May 18th, there's Cop on a Rooftop up at the Warrenville Dunkin' Donut Donuts on uh, Route 59. It's always a fun event. You can make a small donation and pick up uh, something to remember the event by. 
um, and uh, it's usually pretty well attended, but that's from 5 a.m. till 12 noon, cop on a rooftop at the Warrenville Dunkin' Donuts on Route 59, the 18th of May. The 19th is a busy day, bike rodeo from 12, from 9 a.m. to noon uh, uh, over at the gazebo. Also on the 19th, we have shredding day and electronics recycling at Public Works, also from 9 to noon. Um, that's on the 19th. We have uh, a couple of other things too. From 9 to 11 on the 19th is the DuPage River Sweep, the Ferry Creek Cleanup at Kiwanis Park, if you want to participate in that. Again, that's from 9 to 11, the DuPage River Sweep, Ferry Creek Cleanup at the Kiwanis Park. And then coming up on the 23rd at 3 p.m. to 7 p.m., the Public Works Open House uh, at the Public Works Building, uh, where you can bring your kids down and touch a truck and all that good stuff and find out what they do, see some of their equipment, uh, meet some of the folks that make that happen for us in, in a very effective way. Also, uh, coming on the 19th is the Healing Field of Honor to the VFW. Um, uh, we're having that plus the replica of the Vietnam Wall that will be there from the 19th to the 28th. The opening ceremony for all of those, uh, for those two good events um, is at 11 o'clock on May 19th. Everyone is welcome to come and honor our veterans. And that's all I have this evening. Great, other uh, comments from the council? Okay, the only thing I'd like to add is uh, going along with the uh, bike rodeo between 8 and 4 p.m., the uh, police department is uh, undertaking a traffic initiative enhancing the safety of pedestrians and cyclists that's uh, going to take place on Illinois Route 59 and between Illinois Route 56 and Batavia Road. Uh, the initiative will focus on traffic infractions that could potentially create, lead up to, or result in a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. Information regarding both portions of the safety event are on the city's uh, media uh, website and uh, probably Facebook page too. So I uh, congratulate the P police department with uh, that effort. And I think I'm sure they're also gonna be at the bike rodeo registering bikes and uh, playing a prominent role in that special event. So thanks to them. And then uh, coming up, I, I don't know, I didn't hear you mention May 23rd is Public Works Day? Yeah. Oh, you did, okay, I missed that. I must have been going over my own notes. So thanks for that. Um, city staff, oh, Administrator Coakley. Thank you, just an update on our uh, meeting video replay and recording. We are recording tonight. We have an interim, our short-term solution seems to be working tonight. It wasn't working last week, it's working tonight. We will be recording the meeting for replay on YouTube on, off the website. Channel 10, however, is not yet up and running. That's part of the agenda. On the second page, way down the agenda, is a piece of equipment you'll see later. That's uh, equipment purchase is to get Channel 10 working again. These are related but not the same uh, problems, uh, but we keep working on it diligently with the contractor and we will solve it eventually. But anyway, you, you can watch this meeting tomorrow after it's posted on the website again, but it's not playing live tonight. We will get back to that eventually. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, begin the business of the meeting. Uh, we have a hefty agenda. This Oh, I'm sorry. We have a special proclamation that the mayor is going to read. Mayor? to read fast. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, DuPage River Sweep is May 19th, uh, coming up this coming week. Uh, whereas DuPage County, the County of DuPage through the Department of Stormwater Management and Municipalities, Townships, and Park Districts recognizes ongoing stream cleaning and restoration as essential for the preservation of waterways throughout DuPage County and Northeastern Illinois. And whereas DuPage County River Sweep is a countywide stream cleanup and restoration event, organized by the Conservation Foundation and held in cooperation with the American Rivers National River Cleanup. And whereas the purpose of the river sweep is to encourage citizens and volunteer groups to help sweep our rivers clean by picking up debris in and along the waterways and by participating in stream restoration projects. 
And whereas stream cleaning efforts have been very successful, with more than 12,500 volunteers remo removing nearly 270 tons of debris from the DuPage County waterway since 1991. And whereas the City of Warrenville, through its Environmental Advisory Commission, promotes environmental awareness and behavior. Now therefore, I, David Albromo, Mayor of the City of Warrenville, do hereby urge all citizens to make a difference in the quality of our waterways by participating. Obviously, number one, from our perspective, we are very cognizant that it's our role and responsibility as the Community Development Department for the city to enforce this, the fire and building codes that have been adopted by the City of Warrenville. Um, on the other hand, from a, a, a public safety standpoint, we know there's been plenty of studies that show that wider roads encourage um, faster speeds of traffic, um, make it more comfortable for drivers. The, the roads become more auto-oriented and less pedestrian and human-oriented. Um, we also looked at it from a neighborhood character, quality of life standpoint. Um, narrower roads are shown to slow traffic. Slow traffic makes the, a neighborhood more desirable. I remember specifically uh, when we talked about the uh, proposal to uh, reconstruct Warrenville Road, and I think we started out with a, a 32 foot wide road proposal with parking along both sides. Ultimately, after we received a lot of public input from the neighbors and the residents that live along that street, uh, the city arrived at a 24 foot wide road with parking allowed on one side. And I think uh, the neighbors were pretty adamant that uh, they wanted that narrower street because it was more consistent with the character of the neighborhood that they felt was appropriate. Um, uh, we also looked at it from a fiscal standpoint. Obviously, uh, wider roads cost more to build. They cost more for the city to maintain on an annual basis, and they cost more for the city to reconstruct and rehabilitate at some point in the future. And then finally, from an environmental standpoint, there's s clearly benefits from uh, to have narrower streets. Uh, less uh, runoff means improved stormwater management situation, less salt that needs to be placed on the streets if they're narrower, and there's less heat island effects. So uh, from the city staff standpoint, when you look at all those overlapping goals and objectives, we felt comfortable in making the recommendations that are articulated in the staff memo. I just wanted to highlight the, uh, the recommendations that we're bringing forward for your consideration and specifically what we're talking about in this project. So Street A is this north-south connection. This is the extension of Barkley from 56 on the north all the way down to Estes on the south where it would interconnect with the existing Barkley connection between Estes and Duke Parkway to the south. Street A was originally designed to be a 24-foot wide street with no parking along the street. There's a couple of perpendicular parking spaces here, here, and here that would be located off of the street, uh, but the street was originally a 24-foot wide street. City staff is recommending that it be a 21-foot a, a wide back-to-back uh, -back street. Um, and then Street B in this area was a 20 set, or under the original um, preliminary plan unit development approval, it was going to be a 27-foot back-to-back street with a 100 foot diameter cul-de-sac bulb. And what we are recommending is we go with a 20 foot, uh, and that 27 foot street would allow for parking along the north, entire north edge. What we're proposing from a staff perspective is to go with a 20 foot wide street, face to face of curb or 21 feet back to back. And then if you could flip to the next slide, please. Um, it's a little hard to s see here, but you have this in your agenda packet back up. Th what we're proposing and the developers agreed to is to install outside of that 20 foot wide width, street width, another eight and a half foot wide um, couple strips of parking base. So in these locations, the street and the parking bay would be like 29 and a half feet wide. Um, we would always be maintaining the minimum 20 foot fire access road requirement, satisfying that requirement that's spelled out in the International Fire Code that the city's adopted. Uh, so we're not falling below that. Um, we really don't have subdivision standards that 
dictate what the width of a road should be when there's no parking on it. Our standards assume that there's going to be parking along all streets, but because of the unique nature of these streets, there's a, these couple streets where there's no parking on, that's where we're, we're you know, getting into a little bit of uh, challenge on how to meet the city's, city staff's um, concerns and the fire district's concerns on these two roads. Oh, I'm sorry, Phil wanted Phil is, uh, wanted me to point out that it makes sense that this was, a, a, again, originally a 100 foot wide or a 100 foot diameter cul-de-sac and one of the concerns that the fire district did raise as we communicated with them about this is that the 100 foot diameter is not sufficient for their largest ladder truck to circulate around in one contiguous motion. Um, so we work with the developer and the diameter of this cul-de-sac is increased now to, I think it's like a hundred and almost 112 foot diameter. So with 112 foot diameter, the, the largest fire vehicle that the Warrenville Fire Protection District should be able to circulate around that in one contiguous motion. So that is a, a change that we are also able to incorporate into this. Okay, um, I know the Fire Protection District has uh, individuals here that want to make comment, but uh, maybe the best way to handle this right now would be uh, any questions that you might have uh, of Director Menser uh, regarding the content of his presentation, just so that we're all all clear on uh, the road work and the uh, proposal. Any questions from the council? Alderman Lamb. Goodman. Uh, that's okay. My, my first question had to do with um, the part about less road salt. Mm -hmm. Would it really be less road salt? I mean, is the snow plow set to spray salt based upon how wide the road is? It would be less road salt. I mean, there's uh, the, we're trying to get coverage over the entire width of the street so the, um, with the salt spreader, so it would, be, it would be a little bit less. I mean, it's not dry. I, I can't point, say how many times it's going to be, but if you have three or six feet less of pavement, you're gonna have to take fewer passes or use less salt. So um, it's just fewer passes? Because when it goes in front of my house, it sprays it up onto the, in the driveway and the, in yeah. the grass and things. So it doesn't seem to me that it's very exact about. No, it's not. I mean, it obviously it, it sprays out and it bounces and everything and everything like that, but it will be it will be less. I can't quantify how much because you're right. It's not set to you know, 10 foot width or 12 foot width or 14 foot width. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought so. Um, and then, so then the, the other, point about there being a lot more green space. I'm, I'm looking at Street A and, and I think there's um, there's 38 driveways on Street A. So they'd be longer and there'd be somewhat more asphalt for the driveways too, right? Yeah, it's not all net usable and even on Street B there would be, you know, with the even with the narrower road width, you're gonna add some parking back in there and the larger cul-de-sac. But overall there's gonna be a reduction in the amount of asphalt and the amount of asphalt that the city would be responsible for maintaining. Okay, so it's a it's a question of, sort of city asphalt and their own private driveways are gonna be I think that's issues, one factor, but, but I do think there's gonna be a net reduction, not think, there will be a re net reduction in the overall amount of pavement in the project with the staff recommendation and that pavement's gonna be replaced in many cases with green space. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Administrator Copeland. I just want to clarify one thing, and Phil, if I'm off with this, you, you're out there in the building, but the salt spreaders can be adjusted to reduce the amount of salt that's being spread out. So while it, it still bounces around, you can't control where it lands, but you can reduce the amount that's being put on the street. Even if you have to do less passes or the same amount of passes, you could put less salt volume out with the controls they have in the truck. Yes, they can adjust the rate that the salt's dis distributed. Mayor, you had a comment? Uh, just a question for Ron. Ron, your, your changes that you're suggesting, am I correct in assuming that these changes still conform to the codes that we are required to conform to? Yeah, I if you look at the uh, second page of the May 10th memo that's included in your agenda pack up, uh, I did identify in the last two columns on the right side the applicable uh, the best of my ability, the applicable, what I felt were the applicable city code requirements that speak to the issue of road widths. The 
the street bees a, a little unique because it doesn't have parking along the whole length of the street so uh, and again as i mentioned earlier in my comments the subdivision control ordinance does not have any standards currently well not currently ever since i've been here that um, establish what the road width should be when there's no parking allowed on the street it assumes that there's going to be parking either along one side or the other side of the street so i can't it's it's hard to s say whether that applies to street a or b or how it really doesn't and i i noted that in the if you look at street a under city subdivision ordinance requirements there's really no requirements provided for roads with no parking on them Okay, but I assume. But the fire, the the main issue from my perspective is maintaining the international fire code minimum fire access road width of twenty feet, and we are, in my opinion, in compliance with that. Okay, thank you, Alderman Davalos. Thank you. So just to summarize, so I understand from other places I've read, so this international f fire code is with no parking it's 20 feet minimum with one side is 24 and two sides is 27 is that the general gist of it i know that's a general thing but the international fire code doesn't talk about what the width of the road should be if it has parking on one or another side the international fire code says in all cases you should work to have a minimum clear width of 20 feet okay so you know if you have parking on both sides you should have 20 feet of road width plus whatever would be an appropriate width for the parking on each side and it's up to the you know the municipality fire uh, protection district to determine what that width would be and our current our our current code requirements are 21 from 2015 yeah it's 21 foot back to back which okay. means the clear space between the face of the curbs is 20 feet so it meets the the, uh, the international fire code for the 20 foot of clear space. Thank you. Alderman Ashauer. Um, how many parking places did we lose? Uh, I think we lost maybe, I think there was like 22 or 24 parking spaces and there's 11 now, so it's less than half. So that's the um, explain to me who maintains the the off the parking bump outs. I mean, I, they, that we we do it every place else. Yeah. In this wow. case, in this case, the parking bump outs both on Street B and Street A would be maintained by the association. They would be in the right of way as a license under license. So they have to plow them. So we plow our streets, we plow them full, and then they have to have somebody else come and mm -hmm. plow them. Yeah, when they plow their driveways, all, the, you know, all those private, you know, all the, it's hard to see on this drawing, but all these private motor courts. And the, the other thing is, the you, I'm sure you read the same thing I did. The fire department furnished us with a uh, schematic that shows how much space their vehicles take up. Mm -hmm. Um, the proposed road width will have them driving over curbs. I don't, well, which maybe you can point to the right document, so I'm making sure I'm. They, the, um, on Street B, is that not us or is it the fire department? But, but it shows the, the fire truck in several different, it's right, it was right behind our. This drawing here, not yeah. that one. Yeah, that's that's I, I that's the that's city, it. and it what that shows is the, you know, where, where you see them driving over the curb. That's the old design. The new design is the blue lines on top of it, which is the larger cul-de-sac. Well, I'm I'm talking about the turn between Street B and uh, Barkley. Is that a? I, I didn't see that there. Safe access. Over. I don't think they're driving over the curb there, are they? I, I I don't see that they're driving over the curb, but if they are, we could be we could uh, certainly adjust the radius of that curb line if necessary. That's all. 
Any other comments or questions? Ron, I have a couple. I just wanted to ask, generally the character from looking at the topo or the topography lines is these roads are generally flat and straight, correct? Yeah, for the, most no part, for the most hit, part. There's I mean, no if hills. You want to turn back to the other thing. Because, I mean, it obviously, obviously up in here, that's that's not straight. But other than that, they are straight and relatively, I mean, the site's relatively flat. I mean, the road's going to kind of go up and down so that you can get positive drainage on the road. But it's overall, it's pretty flat. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, Alderman Hoffman? Is there fire hydrants on these roads? There's fire hydrants approximately every 300 feet. And the buildings will be sprinkled, and they will have uh, smoke detectors on all levels of the building, plus in all bedrooms under the code. Alderman Berry? <laughs> smoke detectors are wired to the fire department? They're... Um, they're not wired to the oh. fire department. They're um, wired into the power system of the house. Mm -hmm. Which then? Generally, they are. And they're okay. they're, by code, they have to have some kind of interconnection between the, the devices so that if one goes off in the basement, let's mm -hmm. say, for example, the fire detector or the smoke detectors through to the whole house go off. They're all interconnected in that manner, and they're, and they're um, powered by both a battery and the power system of the house, the electric system of the house. Because I know in Emerald Green, we're um, connected somehow that if the fire alarm goes off in the building, the fire department is contacted. I don't believe that will be the case here. I would have to check and see if I haven't looked into, we haven't got that far in the code review with, they haven't supplied, submitted for any building permits at this point in time, so I'm not sure if that would be a requirement here. I'm not, I don't think so. Maybe. Yeah, I thought it. I thought it had to be because I know we had to do it at Emerald Green. Mm -hmm. That we had to be somehow connected. I don't know how we're connected, but we are. Okay. So that no one in the building. Do you have sprinkler systems? No. No. Okay. And so that um, okay. no one in the building has to actually call the fire department, mm -hmm. so that th they are contacted. The fire district might be able to answer that better they are the ones that actually review the uh, uh for the city that's one of the responsibilities that they are primary in is to review sprinkler plans and alarm plans for any development that requires sprinklers any buildings that require sprinklers or alarms any other questions okay um we have several uh, individuals here representing the Warrenville Fire Protection District. Um, I don't know if you want to make a presentation or uh, address your comments. Uh, please step up to the podium and Lee Westrom. I am the fire marshal of Warrenville Fire Protection District, and um, I would I want to thank you with, for giving us the opportunity to to speak our piece on this issue. Uh, I've got a lot of backing uh, from my department here with me. Basically, we have to deal with the street widths. With the street widths and the information that I've given to you, uh, is there any way we could? Okay. Well, this is upside down, so what I'd like to do is basically Street B, right here. Can you see from the front? You we can, can turn, turn it from? We can okay, turn thank you. for you. Twice. 180. Twice? 180. Twice. So it doesn't matter. Just yeah. Got a little room there. Perfect. Okay. We've seen this a number of times already. And um, I'm going to get into the code itself. I'm going to get into specifics with our equipment. But most importantly, if we have a general alarm at any one of these, these are the four biggest buildings in this complex. Six units. Basically, this is 
full fire hydrant access along here for our access for water. We have full hydrants on all these streets for water. And basically what happens is if we have a general alarm in any one of these buildings, we have a full complement of uh, uh, vehicles responding from Warrenville and we will eventually have four trucks or four engines, two ladder trucks, a squad, three ambulances, and five chiefs. And that is the standard uh, response for a multifamily, multi-tenant structure such as these. There'll be two story in the front, three stories in the rear. And this is where our ladder trucks come into play. With these amount of vehicles coming in, our outrigger on our ladder truck, which is an aluminum ladder, is 14 feet, 10 inches, which you've seen on our, on our program that I sent to you. We also have some Excuse me, um, you need, when you're talking, you need to talk into the microphone okay. so we don't lose any of your important Absolutely. comments. Absolutely. Thank you. You have a picture of a three-story structure with our ladder truck. We have to cut holes in the roof in order to get the heat and smoke off the in internal firefighters. And we do not have ground ladders tall enough for that. Secondly, you see firefighters rescuing somebody off of a balcony. What you have to understand is these buildings are going to have three story in the rear. If we have people in 10 below weather in their underwear or their 90s hanging off of those balconies, we have to get them off. Even though they're sprinkler systems, they're still smoke generated. That smoke is going to penetrate all those hallways if those doors are left open, which we find happens quite often. 80% of people that die in fires every year die in single family homes or apartments their own livable space. And the majority of those die from smoke inhalation. So if those people are outside because they cannot make access to the hallway, the only way they're getting out in inclement weather is our rescue. We have to be able, since we don't have ground ladders tall enough, we have to be able to get ladder trucks in there. So the initial response will be our fire engine will come in and bury itself in this court followed by our ladder truck with the 14 foot, 10 inch outrigger. The second ladder truck, which has got to stay out in the street to sweep the rear of the building, is going to set up outside. On the street, the ladder trucks that are going to be coming in is either going to be West Chicago, Wheaton, Aurora, or Naperville, all of which are pierced ladders, which have steel ladders. Their outriggers are 18 feet. At that point, absolutely nothing but maybe a five inch hose line can get by them. So, where we come from, we, have, we are the experts in fire and life safety. We have approached the city and given them these options per se, but our codes unfortunately do not match up with yours. We both adopted the front end of this code. The 2015 uh, building code is very, very wonderful in its intent. The building code addresses in the front of the book what we need to do in our building codes and the back appendixes deal with how we do it. And just about a month before we adopted this code, I met with Dale Ingebretson in his office for a little over an hour and we discussed the appendixes in the back of the book. It is imperative that if you adopt the front of the book, you have to adopt officially the back of the book. And we went through all the appendixes and came up with a list of appendixes that we felt were important. And when I left that day, I was under the understanding that we were in full agreement. We adopted the code a month later with, and I gave you a copy of our adoption. And it lists on the back page uh, a listing of all of our appendixes that we agreed to. Approximately just shy a year later, the city adopted this code. And I've also given you a copy of your adoption. And at the far back page of this adoption, you adopted Appendix F only. So you have eliminated all the appendixes that are in the back of the book that we rely on. So what I'd like to do at this point is to start, 
I would like to go through the fire code itself. Chapter five addresses fire code access roads. They have all kinds. I listed this with your, with your packet, all kinds of information, where they're supposed to be, how they're supposed to be. The authority, the fire code official has the authority. When you get into the annexes, which I also gave you, we have adopted those, you haven't. We have an access minimum road width with fire hydrants that an international building code has adopted with experts clear across the world put this together. And they know, as well as us, that the minimum width of an access road for fire trucks with fire hydrants is 26 feet. And I gave that to you. Turning radius is there. They've adopted our turning radius issue. But when you go to page two, or actually page four, uh, 644, the aerial apparatus access road has to be 26 feet unobstructed, no parking. Now, when we first adopted this, when we were in negotiations with uh, the Lexington home, Lexington is a world-renowned builder. They build all over the country. They know the fire code as well as we do. And we are the experts, and their initial plan came out with 27-foot road B. So road B was going to be 27-foot, and we knew with only one way in and 14 vehicles coming in on the general alarm, we'd have to bury at least four vehicles in here. The rest are going to stage out on, on the main roadway. They'll have to walk all their equipment in. We will not be able to get anything else past. No ambulances, no cots. You put two feet of snow on the ground, and we are not going to be able to access the rest of those units. The fire code addresses it. It's written by world-renowned experts. Lexington, um, they also recognize this, and we've also given you our access with our ladder truck and our widths and the fire districts surrounding us, the mutual aid companies, and their outrigger widths. There is absolutely no way with our ladder truck in the front and the second ladder truck on this road that anything else can get passed. Now, again, we find the situation here, this is going to continue. Our codes do not line up. Our codes were not adopted correctly, as far as I'm concerned. We adopted the annexes. You did not. Now, Dale and I had met, and we discussed all this. He knew specifically this case. If we don't adopt them together, they don't adapt. So you have to adopt the appendixes with the code. If you don't address that specifically in your adoption, they are not accepted. So our codes do not match. But throughout this building code, it keeps addressing the fire code official. Now, the fire code official, by definition, right out of the book, lists the fire chief or other designated authority charged with the administration enforcement of the code or a duly authorized representative. So this is written by national and international experts they're saying the fire chief should be the fire code official. In your adoption of this code, you passed an ordinance eliminating the verbiage in the fire code and changed it to, and I quote, the fire code official will be appointed by the city of Warrenville and charged with the administration enforcement. So at this point, we feel very strongly that we've been totally removed with any enforcement issues or ab abilities with this code. You have not adopted the same code that we did. You did not adopt any of the, and we would like to, we would like to help you. We want to develop in this town. We are not afraid of development, but we feel it's got to be done safely. It's got to be done by the code. We have to get our vehicles in and out and our surrounding towns in and out. We have to be able to access these roads the fire code has addressed it. Lexington addressed it. We've asked for it, and we're in an impasse. So this is going to continue within my home. Our access is what it is, and the fire code addresses it, and we've basically been eliminated from the ability to act on this fire code. So with that said, we've got 200-plus years of experience 
Our fire chief teaches at the National Fire Academy. Our assistant chief, Dave Krusel, teaches for the uh, Downstate Illinois um, uh, Fire Chiefs Association, and he also teaches for the fire marshal's office. He teaches all over the state. We have, we're a modern, progressive fire department. We have all the tools. We know all the codes. We are here to help you, but we have been actually removed from any accessibility to help you. So we would like to see you amend your code adoption. We would like to get the fire chief put back in as fire code official and allow us to help you in new developments. But our, our distances and widths have to be there. We cannot get our vehicles in. We start thinking of two foot snowfalls. There's no way we're getting down this roadway with a two foot snowfall and a couple of illegally parked cars, we're done. We can't get anywhere. There's no rear access to these buildings, so there's no other way down that road. The code also addresses, in Appendix D, it talks about um, multiple family developments and how many access roads are required for certain size developments. We have no second way in. We definitely don't have second ways into areas and in my home, and we're basically dead in the water. We have no ability to, to enforce or get across to anybody the importance that we have of getting back there quickly. We have to get to these balconies. We have to get people out of those buildings. Even though they're sprinkled, there's going to be smoke throughout that unit. Those people can't make those hallways. They're going to be on their balconies, and there are three-story balconies in the rear. So our, we are pleading with the city to please uh, reassess their code adoption and mold it with the code adoption of the fire department. And we are always available to, uh, to help in these developments, but we've kind of been eliminated from the process. So that's it, any questions? Thank you. Questions, Alderman Barry? What is the uh, percentage of um, calls that are received that are actual fires versus um, ambulance calls? What is the percentage oh, well, of a fire, call? Fire calls versus ambulance calls, what is it, uh, Chief? Is it about 65 or 70% ambulance? And uh, say it into the microphone. Uh, EMS is 70% of our calls versus approximately 30%. And how many times in a year do you have a fire call that you have to uh, enlist the aid of other cities? Every single general alarm. We get automatic aid on every fire. Now, they fire alarms is different. We're talking uh, reported structure fires and or uh, actual reported fires. A lot of times we get a call for smoke in the area and we, we stumble upon as soon as we stumble upon a structure fire, we upgrade to a general alarm, and we get those vehicles coming in, like you said, automatically. Okay, so how many times in a year is that, that you have to call in someone else, other than just a smoke alarm issue? You, you need to go to the Take mic. To the Perhaps microphone. you might want to stand up next to Mr. Westrom. I can take him this. Is that okay? Why don't we just no, have no, no. both, both stand oh, up cameras at the okay. podium? Okay. This is Deputy our Assistant Chief Dave Caruso. He's number two in, in charge of the fire district. Number two. Hello, everybody. Thank you. In 2017, we had uh, just under 1,900 alarms that we responded to, which was an all-time high for Warrenville. Uh, I mentioned that our, our ratio between our fire and our EMS is about 70%, 72% to be exact for EMS calls. On EMS calls, engines do respond because there's only two medics that respond right. and someone who's having a heart attack. Obviously, we want the manpower. You want the best service that we could provide. So we still have at least two vehicles that respond to that. As far as alarms go, let me describe to you how that alarm uh, occurs. If it's an activated fire alarm or if someone calls and smells smoke, what we'll get a minimum is, is two engines, one ladder truck, one ambulance, and one chief. So that'll be seven resources that will respond automatically. 
if it turns out to be nothing, we'll be able to stage them and or return them. If it turns out to be something more than a smoke scare, then we will, what we call is we upgrade the alarm. Mm -hmm. And at that particular point, what we'll have is about 33 people responding and 14 apparatus that will respond. That includes the chief's cars, the ambulances, and everything else that you need to be able to mitigate that incident. So one of the struggles that we have is strategy when it comes to this. Because we have a high density populated area with very limited space, we need to be able to put that apparatus as close as we can. The fact is, is it's not the fire engine that puts the fire out. It's the resources, it's the people. And if we can't get the people there, quite frankly, if it's my house, I want those 33 people there. And the question of how often does that happen, it doesn't happen often. But even if it happens once, we want to be prepared for that. Because that's what we do, is we really think about as far as the life safety and try to keep that, quite frankly, we're not your fire department. We manage risk. And that's what we do every day. And that's the focus that we take with it. So our fire apparatus, our ladder truck, is over 20 years old. And it's probably one of the smaller units that's built today. That unit will be replaced one day. And unfortunately, it won't be smaller. It'll be larger because that's the way they're built and the way they come today. So there's a lot more safety and design that comes into that. So we really struggle with that. And while we can be able to respond and get there as quickly as we can, putting that equipment in place and getting those resources in place with the buildings that the way they're designed, most people are under the false pretenses that if they had a fire in their home, that they'd be able to pack their bag and simply step out of their, 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 their place and an area refuge. The truth is, is you have literally seconds and that's not an exaggeration or something to scare any about, anybody about. And we have members that are part of this board that serve in public safety capacity that clearly understand that. And I know that they appreciate that. Thank you. Alderman Goodman. Other questions? So um, this 26 feet that, that you mentioned as a minimum from the international codes, I, I think I may have found the reference you're talking about. That's for aerial fire apparatus. Yep. Okay, there's two of them. Uh, so okay. oh, can you, them, can you explain what an aerial fire apparatus is? So the minimum, the, I do have the slide, but it won't, it won't advance for some reason. Yeah. yeah. Again, uh, keep going. It's not going to move with that weight. It's not? It's, she's going to have to move okay. it for you. Which one? Keep going. We're going to go all the way to the code. It's, it's in that pack. That's the only two that are coming up. And I'll bring the other down. Okay. In your packet, there will, you, will be Appendix D for fire service access roads. <laughs> in Section D-103, it says the minimum specifications for an access road width with a fire hydrant and propane fire truck. Where a fire hydrant is located on a fire apparatus access road, the minimum road width shall be 26 feet. If you go to the next page, the International Building Code addresses the aerial fire apparatus. Lee, Lee, you have to go back. Thank you. It addresses the minimum width for aerial apparatus, and I quote, aerial apparatus access road shall have a minimum unobstructed width of 26 feet. That is no parking. That is absolute unobstructed width for aerial ladders, which would be that entire length of B. When Lexington Homes first approached us, they had that at 27 feet. We jumped right on it. They're on board. They understand these codes, and they build it that way. Now all of a sudden there's a push to reduce them. What the code says is the fire service access road should be the very first thing that's agreed upon. And then the development comes after. What's happening here is we're getting development put in our lap, and we have to then try to figure out how to put a fire truck down it. It's absolutely the opposite of what the code says we should be doing. So I guess my, my second question then is, how many roads in town already fail to meet that? It seems to me like oh, quite, quite a, a lot. 
quite a lot of our roads don't meet your standards, but you must make calls to those neighborhoods. Absolutely, so what do most you do? of them are single family. I mean, do, you, do you put, I'm trying to picture these um, you know, 14 and 18 feet um, supports that you were talking about, do those go in the grass? Mm -hmm. They do not go in the grass. What happens is with our aerial apparatus and the outriggers, they cannot be so put in soft grass. They will sink and the truck will tip. They have to be on hard surface. So what I'd like to do is get you back to this picture. This is a three-story building. If we have people hanging out of this window, it, it's in your packet. There is absolutely no way a ground ladder is going to reach those people. Absolutely. Yes, please. I think to answer your question, if the road width is 20 feet and the ladder truck that sits in the front of your street is 13 foot, 5 inches, all right, let's say 14 feet, mm -hmm. you've only got about 6 feet. Once that ladder truck is planted, that's 34 tons, nothing else will come past it. Nothing else will get down that block. Well, well I mean, I don't, I guess I'm just sort of asking. I don't understand um, how you're operating in the rest of the town then. So your, your concern is nothing else can get past the fire truck once it's there. Mm -hmm. But are the fire codes meant for, you know, two fire vehicles to get through? Cause keep, it, keep this thought in mind. Is there more than one access to that street? And in most of Warrenville, there are multiple accesses. So oh, either well can come I, I've from lived the north in River Oaks all my or life. Or you can so come the from the south. No. Well, except when I lived in Summerlin. An another issue I want you to t keep in mind we're talking townhomes. The six, four, four biggest buildings in that complex are six unit townhomes down there, three stories tall. That's not what you're seeing over here on Gates, that's not what you're seeing over here on Warrenville Road. You may have access where they're s offset off the roadway, but we're worried about getting to the third floor to rescue people out of a third floor multi-family structure. All the, all the high rises we have were all built, all the road widths were all dealt with on the old amendments that we had. And we followed these road widths back in the day with all those old developments. So the rest of Warrenville is fine. The streets in town for the single families, my townhome subdivision is wonderful. We got about 27 feet on our roadway and we have no issues. And right, but Maple Hill allows parking on both sides of the street. That's correct, that is correct. The problem is there is no street ordinance in this town. This is the only thing that we can come to you with and the experts in the international world realize what we need to operate and how we need to rescue people. They're the ones that speak for us. These are, these are worldwide, world-renowned experts that put this code together. You adopted this code, so did we. It's a great code, but you have to adopt this entire code together. This is a multi-family subdivision. This isn't single-family homes where we can throw a 28-foot ladder and get to any, any floor of that house. These are sloped off, three-story. We don't even have, like Ron said, we don't have uh, blueprints yet. So we're going off of some of the preliminary drawings they've given us, and our tallest ladder is 30 feet, and that would reach that window until you bring it out and set it against the building, and it drops. We cannot get a ground ladder to that third floor window. We have to use a ladder truck to rescue those people, and there will be smoke whether or not there's a sprinkler system or not. The sprinkler system will keep the fire intact until the fire department comes and mitigates the rest of the fire there will still be smoke throughout the structure. Thank you, so one last question yes. though. So this, this memo we have from, from Director Menser, and mm -hmm. which, which sets out the existing width, approved PUD, city staff recommendation, Warrenville Fire Pro District recommendation. So am I, am I taking from your comments that their assessment of what your recommendation is is wrong? Because here it said 24 feet, no parking, 25 feet, no parking except in guest parking bump outs. But what I think I'm hearing you say is you don't want either of those. You want 26 feet. What I'm saying is our codes don't match. The city has not adopted the appendixes. I in understand that. I remember so having that discussion when we were voting on the codes. That's off because he's not taking into account any of the appendixes and what they're saying. But, but, so. um, but your recommendation on street A and street B is it 26 feet or not? We had met with Ron 
a number of weeks ago, and we negotiated down, and this was done with me and the fire chief. We negotiated down to 25 foot widths on both roads. On both roads. Okay, exactly. so not, not and what then it says their, in the memo. their recommendation back was 20 foot. So we're, we're going back. We just got the code. We're going to stick with it. And we were told that that, that was going to be the issue. So we're going to stick with the 26 foot unobstructed aerial apparatus roadway with fire hydrants. Okay, thanks. I think I understand. Okay. And Director Menser, did you have some comments? I, I just had a, a couple comments. Obviously, um, it's pretty clear that the fire district has you know, some larger issues than just the Lexington home subdivision and the road west in the Lexington home subdivision. But there were a couple statements that I, I guess I, I feel um, that I need to refute to a certain extent. Um, first off, uh, uh, Lee mentioned that Lexington knows what they're doing and, and they agreed to put a 27 foot wide road in, which is consistent with the International Fire Code Appendix D. And they did put it, have in their original preliminary planned unit development a 27 foot wide back to back road, 26 foot face to face, because that's what the city's subdivision control regulations call for when you have parking along one side of the street. So they didn't have a 26 or a 27 foot wide street proposed with no parking on it as the fire district is now requesting or suggesting. So I think that's an important clarification. Um, the other thing I, I, I really feel it's imperative to address is this whole um, issue about the appendix of the fire code. Lee mentioned multiple times in his comments that you must adopt the appendixes. That's completely not true. The way the fire code is set up is that it's up to each individual municipality to decide which appendixes are appropriate to adopt in that municipality. The fact of the matter is, is that when the city adopted the last set of codes before the first, before the recent go around where we've revised all our codes, the city and the fire district worked very closely at that time, collaboratively, to process concurrently a set of codes, adoptions, and code amendments, and neither the fire district or the city at that point in time adopted Appendix D. So, you know, the, the fact of the matter, the fire district decided they were going to adopt Appendix D. They felt that that's appropriate. They control more than they, they oversee and administer fire codes outside of the city of Warrenville and the fire district, and that's their prerogative. That's not something that staff recommended that the city adopt, partially for the reasons we're talking about tonight. I mean, 26-foot wide roads with no parking on them throughout the city it's a little crazy, I think. I think it, you, people wouldn't want to live on those roads. I think maybe there's situations where that's appropriate, but I don't think generally that's appropriate. And the last thing I want to uh, point out is that Lee pointed out repeatedly that these are multifamily buildings. If you read the International One and Two Family Building Code, it is abundantly clear that these are not multifamily buildings. They are multi-unit, one and two family dwelling units. And that's Throughout the code, that's a critical distinction. When you decide what sections of the code apply and which ones don't, it's critical whether it's, according to the code, a multifamily building or it's a one and two family dwelling building. And when you, these are examples of things of why when the city brought, city staff brought forward the adoption of the codes, we felt that it was appropriate within the city of Warrenville jurisdiction to maintain the fire code official within the city government. We don't have a problem with if there's a dispute, if the fire district disagrees with us, that we need to have a discussion with the city council. But I don't think, I wouldn't be comfortable before, today, in the future to recommend that the city relinquish that responsibility or that authority solely to the fire district. I wouldn't recommend that to the city council. So I think the way we adopted the codes are appropriate given the city of Warrenville balances the various overlapping interests and goals that the community has. And I stand by our recommendations. Thank you. Um, other questions from the council? Okay, Alderman Hoffman, go ahead. <coughs> now if, the, if Lexington Homes originally agreed to 27 foot roads, what, what's the problem? Is it Warrenville just wants to save some salt it sounds like? Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a variety, there's really four overlapping 
goals and issues, public safety being one of those, but it's the environment, it's the quality and character of the neighborhood, it's the safety, not just emergency safety, getting to the buildings or getting to the residents in there, but the safety of the neighborhood for pedestrians and people that live in the neighborhood. Wider streets, 26 foot wide streets with no parking are, are gonna encourage more cut through traffic and higher speeds. There's studies that show that over and over and over. In modern day thinking, not, not, and I'm not trying to dispute when you're, when you're looking at it solely from the fire district standpoint, I'm not disputing that they're not saying they're passionate about it. I believe them, they, they're professionals. But when you look at it holistically, and that's what I think the city must do, or not must not, but should do, that there's other overlapping issues and concerns that need to be taken into account when you make those decisions. And that's what we did is we were reviewing the final engineering as we do with any project. We're looking for opportunities to refine the project, to make the project better. And it was our suggested, not Lexington Homes, our suggestion that in this project it made sense to reduce the road widths. Because, you know, personally, you know, you're driving through neighborhoods and that through Naperville and wherever, um, subdivisions, even if the homes, if the uh, town homes or the condominium centers aren't, maybe aren't of the best, highest quality. They seem to look a lot nicer if they have wider, ro wider roads on there. I, I can't see where you're going to have, um, yeah, that's why we got a police department to monitor the roads as far as um, people speeding and things like that. You know, you, you start shrinking the roads, uh, it's just going to make the, the subdivision look junky. Um, quite frankly, I'd have a hard time voting against anything that isn't recommended by the fire department. Thank you. Alderman Ed Davila. Thank you. Yeah, I, I am still going to have to drill down the details of these fire codes because w when Ron was talking and when I've been reading in anticipation of tonight's meeting, this international fire code that we talked about, the, the minimum 20 feet with no parking, that sort of thing, and on and up, seemed to be not just around here, but it seemed to be uh, it's international. I mean, it's... It's what, you know, a lot of cities have very small centers, for instance. And so people have been trying to figure this out since we had cities. And we have smaller streets and, you know, other, other places do. So I'm confused with what I'm hearing on both sides. So that's, so that's the first kind of problem I'm having. Um, and also, I, I still think that we're f you guys are doing, men and women, are doing an amazing job <laughs> keeping us safe in this area and responding. And I never hear complaints ever about the fire department and, and they're responding to emergencies. Um, so I, I'm kind of building off Alderman Goodman's comment about, so what is going on now? Like I live on a, a dead end street without that rear access. And you mentioned rear access in, this, in, this, uh, in your comments. And I know they're narrow streets and I'm thinking of Emerald Green or the lakes and I, I know they have roads that go around but I would think in a fire you'd expect those fire vehicles to take up all the space and everybody else just gets out of the way. Uh, so I, I'm confused. It seems like we're handling it quite well now. You guys, whatever you're doing, you're doing a good job. And um, now, you, you have the same concerns about, and my other question is, you have the same concerns about road A as road B. Mm -hmm. We're talking about B a lot, but your concerns are, are the same. Are, are the same. We still have to get down to these streets. We're setting up our aerial ladders. We're going to have two aerial ladders set up, one at each end. One's going to take up the entire roadway. The other, ours is a little less wide. It's only 14 feet, 10 inches, so 15 foot wide. We still can't get another vehicle past it, um, but Road B is is the is the big killer for us. Yeah. Number one, you have to realize what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about um, uh, Gate Street with single family homes, two story. We can get down those streets. We can carry ladders down to them. These are three story townhomes, multi tenant structures that we need to get people out of the balconies that are need of, of rescue. The fire department does rescue first, fire last. So if there's people that need to be rescued out of these buildings, we gotta get to those ladders. If we get to a window and there's somebody hanging out and it's 25 below zero out and they're out in their balcony, 
We're not going to allow them to sit out there for hours until we get the fire out and smoke evacuated. We have to get those people down. We have to be able to get our vehicles in when there's a two-foot snowfall and there's three cars that are illegally parked and stuck in the snow. We have to be able to get to multi-tenant buildings. This is totally different than the little single-family homes that we're talking about with some of these lesser streets. So You're exactly right. There, there's a street, uh, uh, Glen Avenue, just got repaved. It's only 18 feet wide. It doesn't e even meet the minimum fire length. So you're right. We do have skinny streets, even streets that we just paved last year. So, but you're you're they're single you're doing homes. your job on those streets, from what I hear. I mean, you're figuring it out. Oh yeah. So I, I guess I want to say that I that we acknowledge all of that. Mm -hmm. I, I I think, and he these are just the things that I'm thinking about. So, I get more calls than anything else as an alderman mm -hmm. about speed on streets. I mean, on and on. Everybody wants speed bumps. Everybody wants more signs. Everybody wants all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I am really sensitive to this idea of bigger streets. Um, and it's a health and safety issue, just like you're coming from the health and safety issue. And, and so this kind of stuff is running through my mind um, as I think about voting to be very careful about there's just competing agendas here. And um, but they all revolve around safety, so I think we have to drill that down. And, and I think there's a lot of things we're sort of considering in all of this. Um, we did negotiate Barkley down from 31 to 27. The problem is with Road B; it is a dead end. There's only one way in. We don't have a second way in. Where Road A, we have two directional access points to all those townhomes. The four biggest units are on Road B all the way at the end. So what are you doing about dead ends now? Like if you came to my street, which is... Single family homes, right? Yes. Yep, two-story homes, right? Right? Yeah. Yep. We can access those. We have ladders big enough to access. We could rescue anybody off the roof if we had to. We don't have ladders that will reach that. We need ladder trucks to do that. So nobody has ladders that reach that without a ladder truck. Is that correct? And Some and towns have banger ladders, which are 45, 55 feet long. We do not. Yeah. Pardon me? Oh, and we don't have the manpower as well. Exactly. Yeah. They're five-person carry, five-person deployment. So a lot of people don't have five men on their ladder truck. So it's a manning issue as well. To do this rapidly and quickly, get somebody out, look at the black smoke coming out of that room. If they're stuck in there, we got to get them out. And life safety is number one. And so there's no debating whether or not we could set up a truck or not or we should be able to get down there. We're not talking about two-story single, two story single family home side streets. We're talking about a multifamily, three-story situation. And there's nothing like that in Warrenville. This is the first one. We Do have smaller town, two-story townhomes in Maple Hill. We have uh, the uh, Cantera. Uh, preserve at Cantera. They're all two-story, very easily accessed by us. The roadways are nice and wide. We've got plenty of water in there, and we ha we don't have issues there. It's getting our ladders to rescue people on those upper floors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is why the code has adopted a wider street for our access for ladder trucks. It understands what we need to set up and where we need to get to. Alderman Wilson. Just a question. You're talking about getting the ladder truck into the right. Okay, which truck comes first, a ladder truck or one of the other pump trucks? Our pumper truck will go in first, and it's going to bury itself into that driveway, followed secondly by our ladder truck, which is going to go into the to the main driveway in front of the building. They'll have the whole front of the building. We call it the truck gets the front of the building. The second truck will set up on the roadway because that's the only access we have to access a rear sweep of balcony. So the second truck will be on the street running its ladder down in between the buildings to pick people off of the balconies and out of windows. So, so we'll have two ladder trucks set up working. So you're gonna have two ladder trucks on, on B at that one unit? Correct. The one, the last one in the row there. We have two ladder trucks right on the single family side. home fire. Absolutely. So you'll have two ladder trucks in there? Absolutely. And a pumper? And three pumpers. Three pumpers all on B? Street no, within well, that? no, that's, that's can, where, absolutely. Where the One engine will be attacked with our ladder truck in the front. Second truck will be set up on the roadway, sweeping the rear. The second engine 
is going to be pumping into fire department connection, possibly if there's a sprinkler system, or they're going to be backing up the first engine with water supply. And when their air runs out, the second engine will be going. And so we got to get them down there, which leaves the other two engines still out in stages. So we've already buried five vehicles down there if we can get two of them past that, that second ladder truck. Okay. Because we run out of air, those gentlemen got to come out and we got to get reinforcements in. This is why we have so many people. We know you get it. Think of it in terms like this. There's 14 pieces of apparatus that's coming to that structure fire. We got to put them somewhere. And if we looked at that one slide that you have of that plat, if you could turn to that slide just for a moment, please. If you looked at the visual, the roads that we're thinking about that we'd like to be able to reduce is yep. where the greatest density is. I want to keep it simple. And we already know, because you heard us, and I know you believe us, and we respect all of you, and we are passionate. And thank you for your kind words, because you also know that we recently just had been awarded an ISO 2, where one of very few that are an ISO too. And it took a lot of collaborative efforts, not just from us, but from all of you, mm -hmm. from this city. And that's how we would like to go forward with this, is to be able to collaborate and have a deep relationship and respect for everybody. Okay, I just wanted to clarify something in your memo, and because I, I thought I heard something different. In the memo we got this evening, under fire inspectors review, it stated that after meeting with WFPD chief officers regarding street widths in the Lexington Trace subdivision, we have looked at all possible issues and came up with these numbers. Street A to remain at 24 feet base to base or B to B. Street B, we agree from 27 to 25 feet BB wide with inlet parking. And SD Street, we agree with, um, we agree from 27 feet BB to 25 feet BB. Is Correct. that still accurate? Because I thought I heard you say something different that you were retracting that statement. Well, we're retracting it only because they won't give it to us. They want to go to 21. So we're going to go back to the code. We, we did negotiate with them, and we told them that is the bare minimum that we could go and operate at all even close to safe. And they, they said they want 21. So the memo that we're operating from that you handed in for us to review and everything is inaccurate? Inaccurate? Yeah, no, that's, that's we negotiated that down, and now they want to change it down to 21. They offered 20, we came back with that, now they've gone to 21. Well, no, are the statements that I read on your memo, are they still accurate, or are you, yes, is they there are. a change? Yes, so they are. So we can agree that those are your recommendations sure. at this point We've negotiated in time. There's, those, there's no change no. In, in that collaborate, previous collaboration Correct. between And that was done between there. me and the fire chief, absolutely. Okay. Sounds like it's a done deal. Um, and then I wanted to ask, you had mentioned that there were 1,900 alarm calls um, in fire 2017. Correct. How many of those were, were fires? Correct. And can you break that down let's further? Let's term that as incidents, and it was just under 1,900 incidents, which was okay. an all-time high. Structure fires, true structure fires, approximately 10 to 12 throughout the year. 10 to 12 structure fires? That is correct. Fires. Were any of those above one story? And can you break down um, how many of them held sprinkler systems within those unit fires? We can, not tonight. We have all that data because that's okay. what supports what we do, yes. So out of 1,900 calls, we're talking about 12 actual incidents. Okay. Okay. Ten? Ten. Ten actual incidents. Okay. And th those are, are those single family? And were there any kind of uh, apartment dwellings or um, 
several story type units that you responded to? We would have to provide the data to be accurate, and I would not, will not want to be inaccurate to you. Okay. Um, would you be able to pro provide that breakdown? I Absolutely. think it would be Absolutely. Okay. Um, there's, I, I just can't believe that there's like this situation that occurs all across the United States, like in San Francisco, where we have dwelling units with very narrow streets, steep streets, and s somehow there's equipment that is negotiating and being able to, you know, get into those places and a adapt. And also, at the same time, they collaborate with the city of San Francisco or the city of Chicago or where wherever, you know, these cases uh, occur. And I, I just wonder whether or not, you know, you had mentioned that you're uh, equipment was 20 years old. I don't know what the lifespan is, but at the time of replacement, are we going larger from what I sound like, or are we going um, to, to modify and adapt to the changing conditions of neighborhoods and, and, and so forth? To address the first question, when it comes to San Francisco or some of the older urban communities, when those streets and those communities were developed, as we all know, were over 100 years ago, how did the fire service adapt? with a different type of, of apparatus that responds. Not the traditional fire engines or fire trucks that you would see here in the Midwest, but they actually are, have a reverse type of capacity. So they're pulling a trailer type that allows them to be able to make those turns and those curves. Of course, that all comes with a cost. So a standard fire truck that we have in the Midwest today cost a million dollars. That's what it cost. And we do get 20 years out of it and ours is actually a little bit older. We hope to be able to keep it in a couple more years. So hey, that's great because it adds to the conservative part of it. We don't get a lot of, lot of incidents. I said that was just under 1900. So we're able to have that equipment last. In reference to the uh, second part of your question, if you could please uh, restate that for me, just I would appreciate it. And that was, we talked about the equipment, the apparatus size, the street design. Oh. I know what it was, is, hey, where we're going with the apparatus for the future. I would, I would speculate that the challenge that we have, if we go too small, all of this apparatus is like a toolbox. And there's a lot of equipment that goes on that. I mentioned the fact that it's 34 tons. A lot of it is because of the frame weight and, what, and the water that it carries because our engines carry, our largest engine carries 1,250 gallons of water, which is a lot of water, and we're really lucky to have that because many communities have less than that. In fact, the majority of communities only have 500 gallons of water. So we're positive with that, but it adds to the weight with the equipment that we bring. One of the things that we have the luxury, or we all can appreciate in Warrenville, is that we provide a first-class service at a really budget rate, and that is because we have a combination fire district, where we're almost truly we're an anomaly when you think about it in DuPage County. There's very few fire departments or fire districts that have combination. Most of them are all career. So we try to do the best that we can. When we do go to spec out that next engine or that ladder truck, I certainly couldn't, I couldn't tell you that it's going to be smaller. And I would venture to guess that it could be slightly more economical and or design, but you're still talking about ladders that are 100 foot long, and those frames and chassis come just as long, sir. Thank you. Alderman Hoffman? Yeah, I just want to clarify something because I think I might have misspoke last time as far as, uh, I'm not gonna, um, uh, I wouldn't vote for anything unless it's approved by you guys, because you're the, rescue professionals, and um, there's reason why there's codes in that. We should certainly abide by them. Thank you. Well, what Mr. Mentor had mentioned about the appendixes in the back, yeah, you do not have to vote for them. But the front of the bill, or front of this book, basically tells you what you need to do. The appendixes in the back tell you how to do it. In layman's terms, that's basically it. So the, to adopt one and not the other, in the front it tells you chapter five, all about fire department access roads, but in the back, they talk about, they've done all the studies, 
They've written it in the appendix. They know the distances that we need, and they put it in the back of the book. And they have to be, if you want to adopt them, they have to be adopted separately. They have to be adopted in writing with the initial code. And that's what we're asking, that you please adopt the same code as we do. That way we can utilize the appendixes in the back to help prove our point and help us in our endeavor with our fire truck. Well, there's a process for that, and if you'd like to address that topic, that would probably be a, a different agenda item than what we're here to talk about sure. this evening, which is the um, width street width re revisions to right. the Lexington project. Uh, Alderman Bevere? Yeah, I just want to make a couple comments on uh, some stuff. Uh, the fire, the actual fires that they were referring to before was a physical fire in the building. They still... Se you know, 71 percent is ambulance, and the rest are fire alarms. So you do have all that equipment coming out. And then uh, I was just curious on when we go to redo a street with motor fuel tax. I, I just hope you know these fall in to the size that meets their requirements. Um, it's something to look at. Also, uh, the uh, Herrick Hill subdivision one end that was one of our last subdivisions and that's all 26 uh, feet uh, wide roads. And then, uh, you know, we talk about calming the traffic, uh, narrow streets make it calmer. Well, I know when we put the bike lanes in on Batavia Road, it made it go faster. Is what the chief had told us, that the speed limit went up after the lines went in. Um, and uh, I just recall that at a meeting. And I think, uh, you know, that's, uh, just wanted to bring up some of them points to look, think about. Thank you. Alderman Ashauer. Just a couple questions. Um, if we assume, um, if we end up providing the fire code official, who's responsible if the codes aren't followed and we're sued? As they stand now, uh, they'll come to us, obviously, and we're well, well documented that we wanted to follow this code. If the code was not followed, they'll come to the city and find out why they weren't followed. Um, and, and why they were put into that way will be off of us. The, the, um, I appreciate the f fact that uh, we have a negotiation that went on mm -hmm. and there is essentially agreement on most I items oh, with a reduction in size on all of them except for Street A, um, and the size of the cul-de-sac, which seems like a common sense thing. The, um, so we, the, if you are the chief fire code official, mm -hmm. if the, the fire department is, then the f fire department's um, responsible even though there's negotiated terms? Absolutely. I mean, at that point, if there's a negotiated term, it's going to be a document written by both both parties. And if there's an issue against the fire code, we're both going to be at, at fault. But um, I, I suppose you'd have to get your lawyer to look at that. I, I, I'm not quite sure how that would fall into play. But throughout this entire book, it lists fire code official shall, and we have the right to, because of our equipment, ask for second means of egress, second fire lanes, it lists all that in there, and without that power to be able to go to you and say, the fire code official is you, we need this. No, And I, I just, I would like to see that power go back to the fire chief is how it was originally intended. And we had no issue before negotiating when we were the fire code official, and now it's been officially written for you to be a fire code official. Um, I'd just like to see it go back. And, and this is in negotiation with my board of trustees. This is one of their wishes that they would like to see the fire chief put back in as fire code official as well. Because we were never notified. We never knew anything. No, the fire chief was not notified. I was not notified. The amendments were never given to us until we ha were handed them. So I was under the assumption when I met with Dale almost a year before you passed your code, we went through all these appendixes talking about which ones we were going to accept. And never once did they come back and say they weren't going to. So we assumed it was going to happen. We sat there in good faith and negotiated with Dale one day, and then they they didn't show up. Um, well, I, 
the um, for community development director Minister, the I can tell you I was that the shame on me for not reading every word, but I was never aware, aware that we were going to take one of our employees and make him the chief fire code official. Um, we did go through the process of adopting apparently part of the codes, and this was part of it, but it was never discussed. We talked about uh, no sprinklers in residences, um, and that was pretty much the focus of what we talked about. Um, I don't recall any qualifications when, when I talk about anybody being hired that would be a, a fire code official. Um, and I, quite frankly, I'm very uncomfortable with it. The, the, um, the fire department has always had a willingness to, to be fair in their recommendations. Uh, certainly they're an inconvenience to developers, but anything that costs a dollar is. Um, so I, I, the, uh, I, I support the recommendations that the fire department has made. I don't think they're excessive. Um, they seem to be negotiated. I, I guess the, I don't know if this is the time to do it or not, but what happened with, how, how do we get at a point where we're talking about amendments and then it just, the, the conversation goes away and that there's no feedback and one party's left thinking that it's the deal that they talked about and the other one thinks, well, we'll do what we want. That's what it seems like. That's certainly the fire district side of the story. Well, well I, right, <laughs> yeah, that's my so, question. Um, I wasn't involved in all those conversations, so I, you know, it's for me to speak directly to those, I, I, I can't because I wasn't involved in the conversation that Lee referenced with Dale Ingebrigtsen, and our chief code official. It was my understanding through that process that the city staff, Dale, provided the fire district the copies copies of what we were intending to adopt um, and you know I, I, I assume that happened I have no reason to believe that didn't happen um, but it's certainly something that I can check into and report back to you um, it's different than what what uh, uh, Lee is saying I, I just don't know the truth that but I do want to come back and speak to the the chief uh, the fire code official. The fire code as it's set up has references to the fire code official, to the fire chief. There's different references to different people in that. And the, the fire code, when we adopted the fire code previously, we did not specify that the Warrenville fire chief was the fire code official. It, it's written in a manner, and there's commentary that goes with the fire code that's written in a manner that's somewhat general so that the um, configuration so it can account for a variety of configurations that exist between uh, of how fire codes are enforced in different situations in the city of Warrenville the only codes that can be enforced are the codes in the city's boundary fire codes are the city's codes the codes that it, the city adopts not the codes that the <coughs> fire district adopts so when we adopted those previously by not specifying who was the person that was ultimately responsible for making the final decisions on the interpretation and application of the fire code it was somewhat ambiguous under the previous adoption whether it's the fire chief or the the uh, city staff so when we presented this to you we felt that it was appropriate to have city staff be responsible because ultimately if there's a code enforcement issue because of the application or non-compliance with the code the city is the one that's going to have to prosecute that and it's our codes and ultimately it's going to be us that are going to be held liable if we don't enforce the codes that we've adopted i don't believe it's going to be the fire district i think it's going to be the city now maybe if you enter into some type of agreement where they hold the city harmless and take on all that legal responsibility maybe that can be done i don't i don't know that would be a, a question for the city attorney so we felt honestly when we brought that forward we weren't trying to slide anything under the table we felt that we're responsible city staff is responsible for interpreting applying all the building and life safety codes that the city council has adopted which are different in, in many cases substantially different than what the fire district has decided to adopt. Um, so that's how we got to where we are on that. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's a little more background that, that uh, the, well, the, I, I guess in 
and to end my comment, um, we're in a position we where we are building more homes taller and closer together than we ever have in the history of this town. And the fire codes are more important than they've ever been. Um, so these type of negotiations where there's something that goes between the city and the, and the fire district are absolutely essential. Um, the, the, I agree with the recommendations. I don't think they're so onerous um, that a few extra feet of pavement are the end of the world, especially since it does accomplish. I, they, they, because they're allowing the parking, we've maintained the parking that was suggested by the developer or, or proposed by the developer. It accomplishes a few things that I actually agree with. All right. Um, they, and I don't think the amount of pavement is substantially different. I mean, when you take the road width that that uh, was recommended by uh, staff and then add the bump outs, the amount of driveways in high road A versus the roadway, we're talking about the, the small areas between the driveways that would be wider. Um, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal to have things be um, done in a way that, that uh, the people that actually have to risk their lives to try and save somebody else's um, have a safe access road to work on it. The, uh, so I, I actually agree with the 430 um, Warrenville Fire Department recommendations, which is the only difference are two, 24 feet on Street A and 25 feet on Street B. 25 feet plus a parking lane on top of that, just to be clear. So yep. that, that street would be 25 feet plus whatever. If you're gonna leave it up to the fire district, whatever they feel is appropriate with for a fire lane or a, a parking lane. Well, the, the, the question would be then is the, would the 27 feet with parking one side be an acceptable width that was proposed in the original planned unit development? We, we accepted that. It doesn't meet 100%, but we felt very comfortable with that. And that okay. And, and that's the challenge. Lee's of the opinion that the 27 feet doesn't meet the code. And staff is adamantly of the opinion that 27 feet meets the intent of the fire code. So we do have this conflicting issue Regular. I mean, he's not making that up. We, we constantly are talking about these things, trying to work through these things because Lee and the fire district are interpreting the code differently than city staff are interpreting the code. Um, we're trying to get the develop, make sure the developers are complying with the minimum standards, trying to apply the standards in Appendix D are above the minimum standards. They're more stringent and to try to apply those you know, it's a challenge. I mean, if the city council wants to adopt, bring back, we can bring back at a future committee meeting Appendix D and adopt Appendix D and have the more stringent standards and abide by those to clarify things. You know, that's obviously a, a policy decision from the city council standpoint, but, um, it, you know, we, we do have a challenge. So, I, you know, the, the, I, don't, I, I guess I'm just trying to share with you the on, ongoing constant need to try to negotiate what makes sense is very inefficient. And try, you know, I, I pride myself and historically have prided myself trying to make sure that the city is applying and complying with the codes that it has as they're written. And, and so, and, and I think that that's the challenge here. Alderman Wilson. Three things. <coughs> First of all, the question before the council tonight is whether or not we approve or, or endorse the Lexington townhouse uh, recommendations that the staff has made. And that's what's before us tonight. Not reenacting re or changing the what fire codes for the fire district, which is a district, not a city. Uh, so the one one. So because the fire code and the fire district adopted amendments to the international code we did not adopt them is that we okay Appendix. so there's an understanding there that you are looking at a different set of rules as opposed to the uh, international building codes no, they're in there 
Yeah, at 503-2-1, where it tells you the dimensions, maximum, minimum of 20 feet. That's uh, here on. Without, question. without the adaption without of the parking. appendix, that's where uh, you Oh, that's my point. That's exactly my point. Yep. So we are, in, we are in conformity with the international codes as written prior to the amendment. So the question about whether or not we want to adopt that amendment in the future is something we can talk about or renegotiate. But the, night, the question to us tonight is about Lexington Trace right. and the question. So uh, based upon the facts that we've had quite a bit of conversation, all very good, interesting. But right now I'm gonna recommend the city council pass a motion endorsing the Lexington Trace townhouse subdivision street with reductions recommended in the May 10th 2018 staff memo. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any other final comments before we go on to a vote? Mayor Brummel. Um, thank you, Alderman, for bringing us back to what we're here to decide tonight. I just make a couple of points. One, um, Everyone in this room is concerned about public safety. Um, uh, to to sing, signal out one group of people as more concerned than the other is not fair. Um, the Fire Protection District has a very focused view of what public safety is and it's important to them. They're passionate, they do a good job. We appreciate that. Uh, the city has a different view that's a little more encompassing as Ron tried to explain. Uh, one of the reasons for changing the decision on the the width of these roads involves other considerations besides just the fire equipment. Um, I'm confident that Ron would never bring a recommendation that would put anyone at risk, any of our firefighters or any of our first responders. Um, he's well versed enough in this information and responsible enough professionally that his recommendation carries a lot of weight with me. It makes a lot of sense to me that again, uh, not to take power away from the fire protection district, but the city should be the ultimate arbiter of code enforcement. That's what we do. Um, to have another agency uh, participate in that is just gonna muddy the waters and make things more difficult, but that's a separate issue for what we're talking about tonight. Um, it seems to me the 20 foot width, clear width is a safe width to set up the equipment and to access a fire. Um, again, I go with Ron's recommendation. I respect the fire district wanting it wider because that makes it a little easier for them to do their job, that makes sense to me. Um, but our code as adopted says 20 foot is reasonable and acceptable. Um, so that makes sense to me. Thank you, Alderman Bevere. Yeah, I just wanted to make one more comment. Um, it's kinda off just a little bit, but we, we used to have a intergovernmental agreement with the city with the fire department. I believe there were some road widths in that, but it had to be d dissolved to come up with a new intergovernmental agreement. There used to be a book that was. It's not. It's not. It's still. In, it's still in place. Oh, it's still in place. Okay, but did that did that have road widths in that? No. One? No. Okay, that's what my question was. Uh, I thought it did. No. Okay. Um, it'd be nice to get together and come up with some new agreements at a future date and get some of these appendixes put in. Thank you. Alderman Davila. Just to be clear, we're voting on 21 feet, right? Even though the the code is 20, it's? It's 21 feet back to back, face to face. The Got clear it. width is 20 feet. Got it, thanks. Which is what the code requires. Okay, I see no other comments. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Thank you for your excellent information. We'll move forward from here. This will be presented in front of the city council and um, voted on there. So um, thanks for the information and thanks for your service, gentlemen and ladies. Okay, moving on to item Number two tonight, consideration of sanitary sewer plat of easement on the Kleiman property. S and senior civil engineer Christine Hocking will provide us with the details on this topic. Thank you. 
Um, this year, the city will be uh, extending a sanitary sewer from Landon Avenue westerly across the Sequestria um, parcel um, underneath the Prairie Path and then along the Climbing parcel um, property line, south or southern property line and western uh, to connect <laughs> to an existing uh, sanitary sewer manhole on the east side of Route 59. Um, the city of Warrenville will own and maintain the sanitary sewer um, within a 15-foot um, easement on the uh, Kleiman property. Um, in your agenda packet, you will see an, uh, a, let's see, you will see the actual plat of easement um, on the Kleiman property. It includes the 15-foot permanent easement as well as a uh, temporary construction easement to allow our contractor to work um, within uh, the area on the Kleiman property. I've been in contact with the Kleiman property owners. They've reviewed the documents as well as our sanitary sewer plans um, and are in agreement with what is being presented. Thank you. Questions from the council? Alderman Goodman. Oh, Alderman Ashour. Um, the, we've got an easement for sewer. I know the intention is to run water through there and loop that system. The, um, isn't it reasonable to try and do it at the same time? Uh, currently, we are working with the Kleiman um, owner and developer, MI Homes, to uh, have them install that water main extension, at least um, easterly uh, underneath the prairie path to a manhole. At that time, we would um, include an easement in their um, plat of easement in their um, documents. So that may come back before this happens? Or not? This is going to be moving forward first. Okay, so we are going to do them separately. Yes. <laughs> okay. Alderman Goodman. I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council pass an ordinance approving the sanitary sewer plat of easement on the Kleiman property and authorize the plat to be executed and recorded at the DuPage County Recorder's Office. Second. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion carries, and next up is consideration of the sanitary sewer plat of easement on the Conforti property, and again, Senior Civil Engineer Christine Hocking will introduce this item. Thank you. Uh, similar to the previous uh, agenda item, this is a plat of easement um, for the construction of the sanitary sewer extension project from Landon Avenue. This is the portion of the sanitary sewer that is located on what's known as the sequestria parcel or Conforti parcel. Um, it is directly west of Landon Avenue, north of um, Point Oak Drive. And this is also a 15-foot uh, easement as well as a 50-foot uh, temporary construction easement to allow our contractor to work. Um, uh, we have also been in contact with the Conforti uh, owner, and he's reviewed the documents and the engineering plans, and they're in agreement with what's being presented. Great. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Alderman Davalos? Yeah, qu quickly. I see it's about $1,100 under the um, enterprise uh, maintenance fund. Um, I'm assuming that gets paid by user fees coming in because of those extensions, and we don't have a problem with that, right? Correct. I anticipate. Okay, thanks. Alderman Goodman? I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council pass an ordinance approving the sanitary sewer plat of easement on the Conforti property and authorize the plat to be executed and recorded at the DuPage County Recorder's Office. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, the next item four, consideration of water main easement agreement with the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County. And once again, Senior Civil Engineer Christine Hocking will provide this information. Thank you. Um, back in January of 2016, an IGA uh, was approved by City Council between the City and the Forest Preserve District um, of DuPage County for the extension of the water main um, along Williams Road north to their uh, proposed and now built um, fleet maintenance building. Under this IGA, uh, the City would own and maintain the water main uh, within the water main easement on the Forest Preserve District property. Uh, this project was completed last year in 2017. Um, the actual uh, agenda, the attachment of the uh, easement agreement was included in that original IGA as a draft, so this is just uh, formalizing 
that actual easement agreement with the uh, for Forest Preserve District. Are there any uh, questions from the council members? Alderman Goodman. Yeah, this is just a cleanup item, so I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council pass an ordinance approving the water main easement agreement with the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County and authorize the agreement to be executed. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. I see no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. We're on a roll here. Consideration of uh, water main easement agreement with the Winfield Town Road Town Road District, and again, Christine Hacking will provide the details on this. Christine, thank you. Uh, this, uh, similar to the previous agenda item, this water main easement um, is uh, due to the extension of the water main uh, to the fleet maintenance building with the forest preserve. Unlike the previous agenda item, this was not presented as part of the IGA. Um, so it's something that the Forest Preserve had to prepare um, with in conjunction with the city and Winfield Township as a new uh, item. Typically we don't have easements in right away, um, but we felt that it was uh, important to memorialize this agreement and have something that would be easily recorded and available for anyone um, to, to obtain and so that in future years we, we, you know, we have this uh, as documentation. So it's kind of a belt and suspenders for, for the city. Um, the uh, district has already reviewed it, uh, the attachment, and they agree um, with what is being presented tonight. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions from the council? Alderman Davila? So these aren't new sidewalks that have to be added to the CMRP. It's we don't have to think about the CMRP. This is the water main. This is water main. I thought it said we agree to maintain the sidewalks. Is that then that was a We're mistake. on item five, the uh, easement oh, agreement. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just oh, went okay. down one too many. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Any uh, comments, Alderman Goodman? I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council pass an ordinance approving the water main easement agreement with the Winfield Township Road District and authorize the agreement to be executed and recorded at the DuPage County Recorder's Office. Second. Okay, motion and a second. I see no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number six, consideration of letter of understanding with IDOT for maintenance of sidewalk at select locations on uh, Route 59 right away. And again, Senior Civil Engineer Christine Hacking is going to present this item. Christine. Thank you. Um, this year, IDOT District 1 will be um, improving various areas um, within the district to update the sidewalks to um, be in compliance with the ADA requirements. There's two locations within the city, uh, Route 59 at Ridge Drive and Route 59 at Branch Avenue, which are included in these plans. Currently, the sidewalk at these locations um, end at 59. Um, they do not cross, they don't, there's no crosswalk uh, across 59. So IDOT has proposed in the plans and we agree with that the sidewalks will now cross at these um, side streets. Um, and not uh, end at 59. Um, there will be crosswalks across um, Ridge Drive and Branch Avenue um, to kind of loop it essentially on the side streets. Uh, I talked with uh, Deputy Public Director Phil Kukler and he stated that we already maintain these sidewalks. So this letter of um, understanding with IDOT is something that IDOT has presented to us just like more of a memorialization of um, the fact that we would maintain these, which we already do. Great, uh, Alderman Goodman. I mean, I, I'm all in favor of being ADA compliant, but I think this is a very silly project. I've lived in River Oaks for a large portion of my life. Um, my mom and I walked out to inspect the sidewalks in question after the last time this was brought up and they're in excellent condition and no one walks on them because walking all the way to the end would take you to Route 59 and you're not gonna cross there. No one would ever cross there. They'd be out of their mind. Um, so making this change and tearing up the sidewalk and spending anybody's money on this is a dumb idea and I just kind of can't believe that IDOT is wasting state money this way, but it's not a huge project. I don't think the city has any significant liability exposure here. I think, you know, putting a little stub in a crosswalk across is fine. There are lots of people in River Oaks in particular that walk in a circle and maybe now they'll walk down a little further in the circle and go across where the crosswalk is instead of 
going to the sidewalk that's at the end of the Rogues Drive and goes right across to somebody's driveway. It's possible that driveway will have a little bit less walking wear and tear, I suppose. Um, but this is still kind of dumb. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Um, but that being understood, I'm going to make a motion to <laughs> recommend the City Council pass a resolution approving the letter of understanding with the Illinois Department of Transportation. Okay, to your point, <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Bevere, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to answer your, your question. Whenever they upgrade a road, they have to bring them sidewalks to ADD compliance. Even though they go nowhere, it's the law. So they're following the law. They have to do it. Or they wouldn't, they lose all their funding from federal and everything else. So that's why they got to do it. I just letting you know, it's got to be done. See, just because reason that we've all heard throughout our lives. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. No, no, I'm sensing no opposition. Uh, item number seven, consideration for phase two final engineering services agreement for deal road turn lane improvements projects. Christine Hocking, would you like to present this? Mm, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the, as you all may be familiar with, the Deal Road Turn Lanes Turn Lane project is located on Deal Road um, near the Target um, area, and we will be uh, adding a left turn lane onto into the Target parking lot, as well as ex extending uh, the uh, dual left turn lanes at Deal Road and um, also into the other main uh, shopping area. Um, Davis Parkway. I don't know why I forgot that name right now. But um, so this is a presentation of the phase two final engineering uh, uh, consultant agreement. Uh, the phase one report was submitted to IDOT and approved on March. Uh, it demonstrated that the, the project will show public benefit, which was part of our surface transportation funding uh, 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 condition of it. So we uh, presented that to IDOT and they accepted it. So we're moving on to phase two. Um, the uh, engineer that submitted uh, the, the uh, agreement was James J. Bennis and Associates. They did our phase one. So they have familiarity with the project um, and they did a good job with phase one. So we followed our uh, qualifications based selection process and this is a special, um, special um, part of that process. Um, the total amount of the contract is $50,000, um, $815, and that is the full amount of the cost of the project. We have been working with DoDOT because uh, in the initial stages, DoDOT said that if it was a public benefit that they could potentially provide some cost sharing. Um, we are currently um, working through an, an IGA with them, but preliminarily they have agreed to providing 50% um, 50 of the funding of um, this portion of the project and for future um, construction and construction engineering for the local portion. STB funds uh, cover the construction and construction engineering phases 80, uh, 75, 25. Yeah. So with that being said, um, this is the contract for the phase two engineering services with James J. Benison Associates. Are there any questions from the council? Alderman Goodman? I thought the memo said 70. Is it 75 percent? Uh, did it say 75 percent? Uh, you just said 75, but I think the memo says. 70. I think it's uh, yeah, it's, it's 70, which which was in the memo. Okay. I apologize. Just checking. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other comments or questions? I think there was one. Alderman Goodman. Yeah. You want to make a motion? I well, don't know. not <laughs> quite yet. Mm -hmm. Do you have a comment, Alderman Gallo? I'm just confused. So this part with this SECO, this doesn't have anything to do with, that's in our packet, this doesn't have anything to do with Deal Road, this soils contamination. This is something else. I don't, I didn't ever understood. That's, a, that's part of the, the um, contract. Yes, contract uh, okay. that Menace, their SECO is a sub consultant to okay. Menace to provide um, soil analysis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. IDOT requirements for phase two. Okay, and that would only okay. come into play if there 
flood soil contamination? It's a requirement as part of a phase two contract to investigate. Sorry, I should have waited to No, that's fine. Stuff. I would like to make a motion mm -hmm. to recommend the City Council pass a resolution approving the contract with James J. Bennis and Associates Incorporated for Deal Road Turn Lane Improvements, Phase 2 Final Engineering Services, in an amount of $50,815. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number eight, consideration of city code amendment to clarify city right-of-way vacation procedures. Director Menser. All right, thank you. Good evening again. Um, we have been working with uh, Bluestone uh, single tenant properties and Thornton's on the potential development of a new Thornton station at the northwest corner of Estes and Route 50 of the northwest corner of Duke Parkway and Route 59. Estes Street borders the north side of that uh, property and it's the city's long-term plan to vacate and eliminate that connecting section of Estes between Barclay on the west and Route 59 on the east. Uh, so in our um, ongoing effort to negotiate a development agreement with Bluestone Limited or Bluestone Single Tenant Properties, uh, we've proposed and offered to the city, not we city staff, but the city collectively has proposed to uh, vacate that section of Estes and convey it to them so they could incorporate it in their development. And they've raised some uh, concerns. They, their attorney and their title company have raised concerns about how are we going to convey them title to that property. And this isn't the first time this concern or question has arisen from a uh, property owner that's been interested in the possible, or a, a developer that's been interested in the possible acquisition of city right away. And the, the issue at hand is, is that there are a couple of different places in the state statutes that address the requirements and uh, the, the process that needs to be followed in order to vacate and convey um, public right away. In addition to that, there's some relatively recent state law and they don't all match up. Uh, the TIF statute addresses it one way. The uh, normal older state statutes that have been around since the early 1900s address it a different way. Um, our redevelopment attorney has recommended that in order to best address this situation, that the city would adopt a, an amendment to the city code that would clarify, let me back up, that the amendment would be adopted using the city's home rule powers to clarify the process and requirements that the city of Warrenville would follow to vacate right away. And therefore that would supersede what the state statutes say and it would clear and it would avoid dealing with the confusion that happens when you start trying to figure out which sections of the statutes apply. So that's what we've worked with the city attorney to develop is that, that proposed city code amendment. It's included in the agenda backup. Um, if that amendment is approved, um, we would need to adjust the right-of-way vacation policy that the city council has passed in the past, which is also attached for your review. Uh, the updated proposed policy. A couple key elements of that is that it, the um, city would have the ability to uh, clearly vacate and convey the property, the entire right away to a property owner if that property owner, uh, if it was felt from the city council's perspective that conveying all of the right away to one property owner would be appropriate um, and sufficient. The recent case law seems to support that position, especially in situations when the property owner that's going to acquire full title to the right, all of the right away is going to compensate the community for it. Um, so I th we think that's in, in uh, consistent with the current uh, case law. And it also clarifies that if, if we were to have, be dealing with some section of city owned right away that, that uh, provides a link to a uh, state between state highways, which we don't have, or would somehow be outside of the corporate limits of the city of Warrenville, which I don't believe we have, that we would have to have a formal public hearing before we would vacate that right away. Um, 
So, um, and then finally, and in that case, we'd have to have a supermajority of the city council to vacate, vote to vacate it. But in any other situations, we would not need to have a, a formal public hearing. It would be on public agendas, and it would follow the process that's pretty detailed in, in our policy, and it would only require a simple majority of the city council to vote for it. Thank you. Are there uh, questions from the council? Alderman Rochelle? Not a question. I. This is very well done, and it takes all the questions out of it. I know there was a struggle in the past over it, and yeah. we worked with what we had, so this is a great improvement. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> great. Thank you. Alderman Goodman. I actually do have a couple of questions. Um, first has to do with the filing fee. Yep. Um, in this draft for the Committee of the Whole Review, uh, section B talks about the cash deposit shall be credited toward actual costs. Any excess amount shall be returned to the applicant and so on. But then the, the policy uh, says an initial non-refundable $250 processing fee. Are those two different fees or is this just it's a, inaccurate? It's it's the same fee. I mean, at $250, it's going to take us more than $250 to process any of these. Sure, yeah. but I mean, it, if if you've got one thing saying that it might under certain situations be refundable and one thing saying it's non-refundable, I just feel this should be clarified. Okay, we can do that. That's a good point. Yeah, we'll clarify that. Um, secondly, uh, in terms of the, the connection with the state highway, when you said it verbally, I think you said a connection with the state highway, and that makes perfect sense. When I read it in um, the memo, it said a link with the state highway, and that made some sense. But the actual language here says form a link within a state highway, and I don't have any idea what that means. This is not clear. Yeah, the, I th and I, w I will follow up with the city attorney. We have had a conversation about that. Um, and he felt that that was the language that needed to be in there because that's consistent with a important section of the state law. Okay, um, I mean, I'm not so familiar with that state but law. But I will, before it's presented to the city council, I'll follow up and, uh, and see if that can be clarified any further. Okay, uh, you know, just as long as the, the language is consistent throughout, then I think it should be okay. And if the city attorney signs off on it, then of course I defer to their interpretation. Thank you. Okay, then I don't see any other questions or comments. Alderman Goodman. I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council approve an amendment to the City Code to add a new section 7-2-6, vacation of the public streets and alleys, and endorse the May 10th, 2018 revised review and processing policy after consultation with the City Attorney. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine, consideration to approve the purchase replacement of electronics server. And Assistant City Administrator Christina White will provide us with the details on this topic. Christina? Thank you. Uh, several weeks ago, the Channel 10 server that controls the recording capabilities of our public meetings and the broadcasting um, to Channel 10 of those meetings and the slides and informational content that we have up on Channel 10 um, unexpectedly stopped functioning. Um, since then, we have employed some temporary solutions to try to record our public meetings, but Channel 10 has been displaying a um, out of service for lack of a better term um, message for the last few weeks this server is a replacement of the server that went down that would restore function to the av equipment to allow us to record the meetings again and uh, broadcast the channel 10 as normal it is an upgraded server um, it would work with the remaining equipment in that room um, and it, uh, the proposal that is included in the packet includes the uh, total amount that is anticipated to be spent, which is uh, over the $20,000 threshold, which would normally require bidding uh, for this kind of work. But because this is um, part of the AV room equipment that we have serviced and maintained through AVI systems, I'm requesting um, that the council waive those bidding requirements and allow us to expedite purchase of the replacement server and installation so we can get channel 10 back up and running. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Alderman Davalos. Okay, so this gets us up and going, but do we have a, a modernized system or should we think be thinking down the road that a whole lot of stuff needs to be? That's a great question, and staff is reviewing the additional requirements for upgrade in that room, which will include looking at the cameras, the projector. There's other pieces of equipment in that room that will likely need to be updated in the next uh, year to two, depending on the age and whether or not it's still being supported by the manufacturing company. Um, that is going to be a separate recommendation from staff in the coming months as we employ AVI to help us look through that and develop quotes and figure out what needs to be replaced. But we won't need another server. This one no, will last us. Correct. This server, uh, th the typical life expectancy of servers um, it can be anywhere from five to seven years, depending on usage. Um, this one, I believe, the current one that just died was about nine years old. Thank you. Alderman Goodman. So I feel like this, this prejudges some decisions that we need to make in the near future, um, that we're continuing with this system, that we're continuing with this company. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that there's, there's this urgency because we've had this problem for a while and things are not working and it's quite frustrating, but I, I, can, I can see how with a server that's only supposed to last five to seven years and we stretched it to nine, we should have been having these conversations a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was a, a predictable problem, and yet now we're rushed for time. So that doesn't feel very good, and that doesn't feel like a good use of taxpayer money when we're waiving bidding requirements. Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with committing to a company which hasn't seemed to have provided very good service lately mm -hmm. when we've had this training and some fixes that were promised and then didn't work out. Um, so that's another pretty long-term commitment to them and to their compatible equipment um, in kind of a rush. So I don't, I don't like that at all. That's my comment. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of the conversations that has been had over the last few weeks is with our IT consultant AIS about bringing in the AV equipment under their managed services contract. So um, up until this point, AV has been treated sort of as a separate animal completely from our IT, um, and there is not in place a replacement program or review. I will tell you that the current contract with AVI does provide for an annual assessment of the equipment and um, the technology in that room. They did come out in, I believe it was January, and assessed everything in that room, and it was working at that time. Um, that doesn't help the fact that it is now not working um, and we've had these issues. Um, this is what I would consider a short-term solution. The, the server itself with a five-year life expectancy is not going to last forever. The integration or replacement of the equipment in that room will be a long-term review because of the expense associated with it. Every piece of equipment in that room is very expensive. Um, if we were to undertake redoing everything, it would be probably upwards of about two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars to do that all at one time. So my recommendation tonight, while not ideal, um, does provide for getting Channel Ten up and running. It is a shorter term solution if you consider the room as a whole, um, but we would work to try to um, include the new Latronic server into whatever upgrades we make with that room. And I'm. I'm confident at this point that we can make it work with whatever future upgrades we do, whether that's with AVI or another company. Latronics is a separate company of AVI. They are the manufacturers of the server. That does not necessarily require us to stay uh, committed to AVI as the maintenance and support for that equipment. Um, I have a couple quick questions. You're assume, uh, we're assuming that we want to provide the same level of service, correct, uh, that we currently have, which is um, in comparison to other municipalities and even what the county does probably goes a few steps above and beyond as far as quality of the, you know, uh, presentations and the, the mm -hmm. film, uh, videotaping and replay of the city 
city council meetings. We're not necessarily bound by law to provide the level of service we're providing, correct? That is correct. And so um, I guess with that, have we studied the possibility of con contracting this out and whether there would be a long-term savings? Because uh, it seems like there's you know, generally two individuals that are staffed to to manage the level of service that we're providing. And I, I would just be interested in finding, I, I guess, out more, I guess, information if this is really the same direction we, we want to go in or whether we want to, you know, maybe become a little leaner in our presentation and uh, provision of service with this regard. Um, there, there were a couple different parts to that, so okay. I'll, uh, let me answer it the way that I processed it. Um, it is to some degree the level um, that we are currently providing, although with the new equipment, there will also be the added function of being able to live stream the meetings. Um, that may or may not be something that we decide to turn on, but there is that function, that capability with this new equipment. Um, the requirements to record or broadcast meetings that is not something that we're legally required to do um, if the council uh, would like to have a discussion about not uh, about not continuing that into the future or doing something different that's certainly a discussion that we can have at a future committee meeting um, to review those options uh, I have not done a comprehensive cost analysis between what we're currently doing with having the AV room and having our two uh, part-time AV techs assist with recording the meetings. Um, but I can tell you in the last few weeks, trying to um, scramble to find AV technicians that we could outsource to that could come in and videotape the meeting. We did have that one meeting where we had people in the back of the room and they were able to wide pan the dais and, and record the meeting that way. Um, it was not, in my opinion, more cost effective. It was the opposite, <laughs> more cost effective. Um, it, that was a short-term, um, immediate solution to have the video, to have the meeting recorded. Um, we certainly could look at a more comprehensive, long-term cost analysis, but I don't think it would be less expensive to have, uh, to have it outsourced. Thanks for your thoughtful answers. Um, I don't know, depending on where the council wants wants to go with this, we could either, you know, fix it for the short term with a twenty-four thousand dollar investment or uh weigh the pros and cons of doing it differently. And uh, you know, continue a discussion on this item as I see it. Any comments? Alderman Wilson? Thank you. Uh, you want to repeat that, please? Okay, we go. I'd like to recommend the City Council waive bid requirements and authorize the purchase of a replacement server from AVI Systems Incorporated in the amount of $24,484. Okay, motion and a second. And if there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries. Um, the next item is item number 10, consideration of city council policy to prioritize processing of development applications and building permits that incorporate solar power improvements. And um, Director Menser is going to handle the presentation Still on here. this topic. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious, um, did Ms. Schmidt, did you want to make any comments regarding uh, this? Just thumbs up? Okay. <laughs> Director Menser. So, so we have been uh, obviously interacting with a, a variety of private property owners and developers uh, on a number of different projects in the community, and repeatedly we uh, continue to advocate that they take a closer look at incorporating and try to incorporate solar uh, into their projects. Um, unfortunately, up to this point in time, they, they really haven't been very receptive to it. And th I, I think, I truly believe that they're operating under um, 
outdated information. Um, the uh, structure of the laws in the state of Illinois now require the power companies to buy solar or renewable energy credits from people that generate, uh, not buying the energy, but buying the credits that confirm that the energy was generated uh, by a renewable energy source. Um, and those have value and the power companies have to buy them for a 15 to 20 year period. So it's almost a commodity. And when you incorporate that commodity value into the decreasing cost of the solar installations, um, the energy savings that the property owner receives and the federal tax credits, which are at this point in time, 30% of the installation costs, it really the financial payback period is somewhere between four and eight or nine years, depending on the installation and the details of it. Uh, but that's much better than it was two or three years ago before the new state law. It used to be somewhere in the range of t 12 to 20 years. And of course, that wasn't something that was attractive to the private sector. So we've continued to encourage the private sector to look at this. Um, again, they've been reluctant to do so. Um, so rather than the, the plan commission is, some on the plan commission have talked to me about, well, can we mandate it? And my response was I'd definitely prefer not to mandate it, and that wouldn't be something that I would recommend that the city uh, pursue. Um, so in brainstorming about what we can do to maybe provide a, an additional incentive uh, for somebody to take a closer look at and potentially incorporate solar into their, their projects is if we would give them uh, priority from a processing standpoint. Right now, that's a valuable commodity in the Community Development Department. We have so much going on that we really have more projects, more work than we can keep up with. So inherently, certain projects are moving slower, projects are moving slower than um, what we would like to see them move and what our past experience would be. But if the City Council would pass the recommended policy statement if there was a development, and there isn't any at this point in time, that was going to take the leap and incorporate solar into their project, they would receive priority processing under this policy. Well, so that's what we're suggesting that the City Council consider. Um, it's an incentive rather than a hammer. Thank you. Questions from the uh, Council? Alderman Davila. You have one very Happy Alderman here. Thank you very much. Um, everybody knows how I felt about the decision packages and that we were putting this sort of as a number three priority in the work plan. And while I understood it totally, I just totally got why that had to be in the back of my mind was like, we have to get on board with this <laughs> because everybody in the end is gonna get on board, I think, um, ultimately. But it, it is an economic decision. Um, and people just don't see it yet. So I, I also was glad that it wasn't required. I, I think that's gonna be a stumbling block for us right now. So I was really thought it was very clever to be doing it this way. So thank you very much, very much in favor, and let's see where we, where we get with this. Thanks. Alderman Wilson. Uh, just a comment that we are offering this as, as one means it's certainly the carrot. California is in a process of passing mandatory, every home has to be solar acceptable. So let's not put the hammer down, let's offer a carrot at this level. I'm delighted to see it. Alderman Goodman. Yeah, I, I think that the, the price drops in solar power have just been astonishing over the last several years. I know that there's a proposed tariff in the works that might reverse some of those gains, and I certainly hope that that is rethought and, and not implemented. Um, but even so, we, even with a tariff, the, the prices are still so much lower than they were several years ago. Um, it really makes me wonder why everybody's not doing it already. It seems like you're behind the curve if you're not. Um, and, and I can understand that, that you know people are afraid to be early adopters, but solar panels are not new technology. That they're, they're just really not. And because of the competition internationally, because there's so many um, new solar panel makers, uh, the prices have just fallen precipitously.
piece of it is through. So I'm, I'm excited to, to see the staff taking steps in this direction, and I look forward to when our priority three items get moved a little higher up the list. So I would like to make a motion to recommend that the City Council endorse the policy statement prioritizing the City's review and processing of building permits and development applications that include private solar installations, as outlined in the May 10th, 2018 memorandum from Community and Economic Development Director Menser. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, item number 11 is consideration of a request from Warrenville and Bloom to install and remove floral planters. Deputy Dr Public Works Director Phil Kukler will uh, provide us with the details on this. Phil? Thank you. Uh, Warrenville and Bloom approached city staff about um, taking over the uh, installation and removal of the planters, both the hanging planters and the ones that are on the bridges um, earlier this year. And uh, staff reached out to J.H. Baldwin and Sons, who's been doing this the last 10 years or so for the for Warren Bloom Bloom, just to get a feel for how what type of efforts involved. And uh, Baldwin uh, indicated it took about two days, a two-man crew, two days to install them, and then two days to take them down. So it'd be a t total of about 32 man hours to do that. Um, we're obviously relying on their input for this. So um, at this time, staff's recommending that we would take this on for this year only to evaluate how much effort it really does take. And I mean, right right now we actually do store the uh, the planters over the winter and then in the spring WIB approaches us so we can get them out and they can ship them away to get them uh, filled with flowers and uh, brought back by uh, I think it's the Thursday before Memorial Day so I'm I'm recommending that we uh, that we take this on for this year only and evaluate the, the man hours it takes to do it and um, in the future if they want to have us do it again next year we could come back with some real data as far as what it actually takes city staff to do this work thank you any uh, questions from the council members? Alderman Davalos? So I can't remember who waters the planter. Do, do, do Warrenville and Bloom take care of that, or does the city water those planters? Uh, Warrenville and Bloom hires a contractor to come out and water the planters. And they're still doing that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Goodman? I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council direct staff to install and remove the floral planners for Warrenville and Bloom in 2018 and analyze the actual effort involved in doing so. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So you got some extra help, Dorothy. Okay, uh, item number 12, consideration of city code amendment to restrict parking on Talbot Avenue. Deputy Public Works Director Phil Kukler will handle this item, Phil. Thank you. Um, city staff had received a call from the Park District uh, expressing concern over the parking of cars on both sides of Talbot Avenue north of Calumet leading up to Summer Lakes Park. Um, they talked about that, that concern got passed along to the police chief. He evaluated it and suggested that parking should be eliminated on one side of the road or prohibited on one side of the road to allow um, better access for emergency vehicles in case there might be an emergency in that area. Um, I concur with that and our recommendation is to prohibit parking on the east side of Talbot Avenue between Calumet and Summer Lakes Park and then um, assuming this gets approved, Public Works would fabricate and install the signs once it's approved. Great, thank you. Any uh, questions? If not, Alderman Goodman. I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council approve an ordinance amending the City Code to prohibit parking on the east side of Talbot Avenue north of Calumet Avenue West. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Item 13 is to review and file the quarterly economic development activity report. It's for our information. If there's no questions, We'll move on to item 14, which is to uh, review and file the Community Development Department fiscal year 2019 decision packages status report. And that's for our information. If there's no questions or concerns, we'll move on to item number 14, which is to review and file the Community Development Department fiscal year 2019 work program status report. And uh, that's for our information. If there's no 
comments or questions, we'll move on to our last item this evening, and that is item number 16, to review and file the bi-monthly code enforcement activity report. If there's no questions or concerns regarding this, uh, we don't have any miscellaneous items. There's no closed session. There's one remaining item of business to do. Uh, Alderman Goodman. I move to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And unanimous. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>